turn it over to you, Tom. Thanks so much, Allison. Yeah, so this is gonna be a very code heavy presentation. There's gonna be a lot of R code. Um, my goal is kind of to just show it and kind of walk through specific parts. All of the code is available and the slides are available online. So I'm gonna leave this link up here for you to look at. So if you do wanna follow along or look at it after the fact, it'll be there. So before we get started, huge thank you and a shout out to the NFL Scraper team and the NFL Faster team. Both of these are basically the gold standard for publicly available NFL data. So a lot of people have put together kind of collecting this data, cleaning it up and making it easily available. Additionally, I'd like to thank, you know, Mike for bringing me in here. When he invited me, I was like, oh, you know, I'll ask Twitter like I always do, what should I do with my life? And so I asked people what, what I should present on. And of course, everyone voted on the one thing that I had not kind of prepared material for, which was tidy models. So I do have some other material based on like, you know, ggplot or using uh, dbplyr to call SQL from R. That's all available at these links, but today we'll be talking about tidy models. So I like to do personas for my presentations or teaching material. So I have some assumptions. My assumption is you've done some modeling in R. You're interested in fitting models in R with sports data. You're new to tidy models and you want to fit models to sports data. And you're awesome because you came here tonight to Hannock and you love hockey problems. So that's all good. Again, the slide links are available online and there's a repo with all the code I used today. You will have to scrape the two gigabytes of data yourself. I did not want to put that up on GitHub again. So tidy models is a framework or collection of packages for modeling and machine learning using tidyverse principles. There's eight packages listed here. You don't have to kind of load them individually. You could just load them all with a library tidy model, similar to how you would do library tidyverse. But really it's just trying to make a consistent uh, API that's very user friendly and very powerful for doing machine learning in R. For today's data set, again, I used NFL Scraper. This is actually NFL Fast R, which builds on the NFL Scraper data set to go back to 2000. So this is originally about two and a half gigabytes or 2.2 gigabytes of data. I filtered this down to about 15 million data points um, across 630,000 run or pass plays. And the goal for today is pretty simple, just kind of a toy example. Predict if an upcoming play will be a run or a pass play. Got a bunch of features here we're gonna look at. As far as the data prep, because this part was mainly done in you know, just general tidyverse, I don't wanna get lost in the steps, but basically I um, use the data on disk with dbplyr to pull it in. So I didn't have to load all 2.2 gigabytes. I just pulled in kind of the filtered data all ready to go. I did do some feature engineering. So for this, I do want to slow down for a bit. Um, I added a few columns that weren't there. Total runs, which is kind of cumulative runs up to that point. Total passes, which is cumulative passes up to that point. What kind of play was previous or was it the first play of the drive? And if uh, the previous play, kind of making sure that it wasn't an NA, it's the first play of the drive. Because if you do a lag, it'll actually throw an NA. And then I converted a bunch of uh, text columns into factors so I could use them in modeling down the road. So the first part of tidy models and kind of the first step of doing any machine learning is you need a training set and then a holdout set or a testing set. So in this case, we have training data, which we're training our model on, and then testing data, which we're testing our model against. So Tidy Models has a nice approach to this. You do initial split on the plays. I say I want 75% in my training set, 25% in my testing set, and I want to stratify by play type. So this means that I'll have an equal number of run and pass plays in both the training and the test data set ready to go. And I can check to make sure that those ratios are accurate by just doing some quick counts with dbplyr or with dplyr. So 57% pass, 57% pass in both the test data and in the training data. So we have kind of a balance here, uh, although you could still do an additional step to downsample to make it like 50% pass, 50% run. But in this case, at least we have equal ratios in both. And this is pretty normal for what the NFL would see anyway. The next step after you've kind of uh, split into your test and training is you want to set up uh, a few pre-processing steps. And we do this with recipe, where a recipe can be thought of as the specific changes you're making to the data set ahead of um, machine learning. So these will all be either step or update. So you could say like step correlate, this will remove all uh, self-correlated you know, variables. So if like yards gained is equivalent to a yards gained divided by 10 or something, it would filter out one of those columns so you only have one. 
step center would be subtracting the mean from the numeric so that you could use it for like linear modeling. Uh, step ZV would be removing zero variance predictors. So if there's a column that says this is NFL and it's all NFL, it'll just drop that from the data set. What you can do with this is that you can apply this very consistently across many different models rather than having to rerun this multiple times. So the next step would be choosing a specific model. So we have feature engineered, we've pre-processed, we want to set a specific model. We'll start with a logistic regression where Parsnip uh, allows us to set a very consistent input or very consistent um, approach to using these models. So rather than having to call a specific framework, we can just say, I want a logistic regression, I want to classify, and I want to use the GLM package as my engine or what the actual model is coming from. I'll save this as a logistic regression model. I will then combine the Parsnip model, which is this logistic regression and the recipe together into a workflow where the workflow can be thought of as this is kind of the object I'm passing around that I actually want to use. So I can call this to fit the model or train the model rather than lugging around like five different things. It's all captured in the model. There's some additional details here about what that actually means, but really it's just, you don't have to keep track of separate objects. All the prepping and model fitting can be done with a single call to fit, to train the model. And downstream, if you want to do tuning for hyperparameters, you can do those with the tune package very easily. So we pre-processed, we've um, added features, we've split the data, um, we put it all into workflow. Now we can actually do our model training. So we take our logistic res regression workflow, all that thing bundled together, and then we just call fit. And we tell it to use the training data. So we're fitting the model against the training data. That's it, one liner ready to go. After that, you wanna figure out, okay, well, what am I actually predicting? Like I've trained my model and I wanna predict some outcomes. So in this case, you just call predict. So you take the same fitted model. So this is the trained model and play by play logistic regression. I'm using the test data this time because I'm testing it against my holdout sample. I'm gonna add some columns to this. So for every single, um, what's it called? For every single play type, I'm gonna predict some type of outcome and I'm gonna do the probability. Additionally, I'm gonna add back in just the uh, truth, which is the actual play type from that play. So I have both the predicted play and what the play actually was. So I can compare against them for how accurate was my model at the end of the day? We're testing the accuracy, we come to yardstick, which is measuring how accurate the model is. So for here, we're gonna plot uh, rock curves, get area under the curve, and then collect general metrics. So we've um, predicted, so play by play pred predicted logistic regression is the trained and fitted model that we predicted against our testing set. We can call rock area under the curve where the truth is the actual play type. So we know the actual outcome is play type and what did we predict for predicted pass. And then we can also collect some metrics where we're again saying the play type is the actual outcome and what did we predict for the class in case of pass or rush. So you can see our model has a pretty good uh, rock curve. So it's you know pretty far out here. Our accuracy is okay. It's about 69, 70%. Um, and I actually fitted this curve based off again, the fitted model. So play by play predicted logistic regression, just called rock curve and then pass it on to ggplot's auto plot. So it automatically made a graph for me. So this was kind of a whirlwind. I'm going very quickly through this because I want to make sure that we kind of cover all the details and all the code is here. But the next question is like, why do I even want to go through all these steps or learning a new package? So putting this all together, you can see it's really not that much code. So I split the data. With my initial split, training, testing, I pre-process and choose a model. So I add a recipe, do all my changes, set an engine, choose logistic regression, combine this into a workflow, fit the model, do my predictions, check my metrics. It's a very consistent kind of loop and you can kind of change these parts as you go along. The next part would be, okay, well, what about changing the model? So my logistic regression was about 70% accurate. What about a random forest with a thousand trees? And just fair warning, if you run this at home, this is like 22 minutes to run, so be patient with it. So we do pretty much the same thing. Instead of a logistic regression, we say random forest, a thousand trees. We set the engine to ranger, which is an R package that's very quick at doing random forest. We keep impurity, uh, or sorry, keep importance. So we can look at variable importance down the road. 
and we want to parallelize it on, our, on the four cores out of my MacBook. And classification, because we want to say, is it a run or is it a pass? We keep basically the same workflow. We just change random forest model instead of logistic regression model, do our fit, and then we do our predictions on that data set saying, is the play type compared to the predicted play type? And if we compare the two models, so here we have our random forest, here we have our logistic regression, and we're calling our metrics, we can see that we were about 72% accurate for our random forest versus about 69% accurate for our logistic regression. So again, we were able to reuse a bulk of that code and just change the model code it itself to do a new type of code. And you could do this with an XG boost or some other type of model uh, very quickly as well. Additionally, because it's a random forest, we can pull out uh, feature importance. So we can see that across um, about 20 of the different features we had, uh, shotgun formation, uh, where they were on the field, how many yards were needed to get a first down, um, and the total pass plays uh, up to that point were the most important features for determining our prediction, which kind of makes sense logically. Like if it's farther to go, you need to probably go with a pass over a run or, or the likes. So you kind of expect this type of play. Lastly, again, we can also compare um, our random forest or logistic regression in a graph. So we actually get our rock curve for random forest with just rock curve, logistic regression rock curve with rock curve. And then we bind those rows together and put it into ggplot. And we can see the random forest is slightly more accurate across the span. Um, yeah. So that's it. I know it's running through a lot. All the code is up there and happy to answer questions after the fact. Um, I'll also be doing a blog post about this later. Thank you to everyone here for inviting me and bringing me along. And there's a bunch of other resources here if you want to learn some more. Awesome. Really good timing too. Uh, we have a couple minutes. Um, there's one of, do you see a significant difference in performance between R and Python, keeping the obvious variables constant? No, I mean, a model, like, a model library is a model library. Most of it is just the API to access it. So if you're using Python, you're probably using scikit-learn, you know, a consistent API to access a bunch of different models. Uh, tidy models is kind of a similar approach in R, which is a very consistent kind of user-friendly framework to do machine learning. So in reality, you know, I don't think there'd be any difference between R and Python. It would just be preference. Um, but all the code's up there, so you're welcome to rerun it in a different language and kind of check it out. We have another question on Tidy Tuesday. Can you give us a bit more background on that and what if people want to be more involved or they're just like average R users right now and want to, you know, sharpen their toolkit? Yeah, so Tidy Tuesday was something I started as a grad student when I was finishing up my PhD because I was trying to find a job and I was like, hey, I can interact with a bunch of people and try and help people see my skills and help other people share their skills. So. Every week, um, the R4DS online learning community um, posts a data set on Twitter. And if you go there, you can read the data into R. It's CSVs. You can read it into whatever you want, honestly. Um, do some analysis. Usually people do visualizations or some basic modeling um, and then share those results on Twitter. Um, because there's a hashtag with hashtag Tidy Tuesday, um, you kind of have a captive audience in terms of if you have zero followers on Twitter, you can still get your message out there and get feedback on things. <laughs> Yeah, I love that. <laughs> More like community-based than, you know, looking uh, looking as an individual to keep progressing. So thank you 